Well, good morning, folks. It's uh, great to be with you today. I want to thank you for having me out here to speak. I want to talk to you this morning about your origins matter, and your origins really do matter. It matters whether or not we uh, came from evolution or whether or not we were created in the way that the Bible teaches. And I want you to, first of all, consider the United States of America. Now, we have the most churches, the most Christian colleges, Christian bookstores, Christian radio and television of any nation. And yet, for all of these Christian resources, would you say we're becoming more Christian every day or less, less Christian every day? Less Christian. Less Christian. Yeah, everywhere I go, people say that. And it certainly seems that way. How is it that for all of these resources, it seems like we're becoming a pagan nation? What is going on? And is there any connection with origins? Well, that's a totally separate issue, right? Well, actually, it's not. They're, they're connected. You see, all of these problems that we have in our society can be traced back to a broken law of God where people have decided, we're not going to listen to what the Bible says. We're going to do it this other way. And, and why would they do that? Well, because people don't have confidence in God's word. They don't really believe that this is the inerrant or infallible word of God. And where does that doubt begin? Where, what is the most attacked book of the Bible? It's Genesis. It really is. You see, all of these issues really are the same as the issue between creation versus evolution. It's God's word versus man's word. That's really what it comes down to. It's just that simple. Are we going to listen to what God has said in his word? Or are we going to let man, independent from God, determine truth? I'm going to suggest to you that the loss of biblical authority beginning in Genesis is the root of the decline of Christian America. That's where, that's where it begins. It doesn't end there, but that's where it begins. If we can't trust those opening chapters of Genesis, why would we trust any of the text that comes afterwards, right? When does God start telling the truth? Well, I think he started on the first verse, and that's what I want to encourage you with today. You see, evolution really is designed to explain how life could come about apart from God. It is naturalistic, meaning, the, meaning that uh, no miracles, right? It means that, that God has, or that if God exists, he has to work within natural law, and he's not transcended to it. But evolution really is designed to explain life without God at all. That's the point of it. And I know a lot of Christians want to try to add God into the mix and say, well, maybe God used evolution. That really defeats the purpose. It's, it's supposed to explain life naturally. The idea is that chemicals came together just sort of mindlessly and formed a living cell, something like a bacterium, and then that through reproducing over hundreds of millions of years uh, eventually became birds and reptiles and fish and human beings, right? All these different forms of life. And so if that's true, then you are actually related to broccoli. That's your distant cousin. I, you know, I mentioned that one time. I was speaking to a group of atheists, and I mentioned that. I said, you know, in your worldview, you, really, you, you believe you're related to broccoli or something like that. I can't remember what it was, if it was a turnip or something. But uh, something, to, I wanted to get their attention. And then afterwards, some, one of the folks came up to me and says, well, you were, you were kind of making fun of this. That, you know, wasn't that kind of mean? And I said, well, isn't that what you believe? He said, well, yeah. I said, well, there you go then, right? I mean, if, if that sounds a little bit weird, don't shoot the messenger, it's your belief, right? Maybe you ought to reconsider your belief. Anyway, what you believe about the past has consequences for the present. You see, if creation is true, then that means God's word is true from the beginning, and that means we're gonna have laws, for example. Now, why would we have laws? Because there's a lawgiver. God made us, he made us in his image, he has the right to set the rules, and so of course we're gonna have laws from God. And I have a good reason to obey those laws because God's holding me accountable to his moral code. There, judgment is coming. Uh, marriage, where does the idea of marriage come from? This idea of man and woman united by God for life? Well, that goes back to Genesis, doesn't it? God created the man and the woman in the beginning, and, and for that reason, uh, marriage continues today. God instituted the family unit, and he did that in Genesis. Or standards, standards of behavior, standards of clothing. I noticed you're all wearing clothes today. I appreciate that. I'm sure you do too. Uh, well, it wasn't originally that way, but because of sin, we understand God uh, provided skins of clothing as a symbolic covering for our shame. Uh, meaning of life. Why is it that human life is so valuable and precious and and, and different from, from animal life. Why is that? Well, it's because we're made in the image of God, right? Animals aren't. Now, I understand biologically we're, we're classified as a mammal. I understand that. That's fine. But we're different from the other creatures that the Lord made because we, we're made in his image. And, and that's why I can't just go out and shoot somebody that I don't like, right? Because that person's made in the image of God and therefore has intrinsic value. But you see, if evolution were true, you'd get a different set of standards. If it were true, logically, there wouldn't be a basis for moral laws. Because you see, laws are designed to protect the weak from the strong, but evolution is, des evolution is all about the strong dominating over the weak. That's how it's supposed to progress. 
laws are anti-evolutionary by their very nature. Or for that matter, why not do what you want with sex? I mean, if we're just animals, that animals pretty much do what's instinctive. Uh, they don't worry about uh, morality and things like that. Or abortion, right? I mean, get rid of spare cats, get rid of spare kids. If we're just rearranged pawn scum, what's wrong with getting rid of a biological accident of nature? And of course, I'm not suggesting for a moment that evolution is the cause of all these problems. Obviously, sin is the cause of those problems. But I am suggesting that evolution gives people a way to try and justify that sin in their own mind. It really does. And by the way, Jesus understood that these Christian doctrines are only defensible if Genesis really is history. He often quoted from Genesis or alluded to it in some fashion. In Matthew 19, when the religious leaders were questioning Jesus about divorce, to explain marriage, Jesus went back and quoted Genesis 1 and 2. And he quoted from it as if he believed it was real history and that that was actually the basis for marriage. How about that? We see what's happened in our culture is that foundation has been eroded in the minds of people. And many people think, well, you, you, know, you can't you can't trust Genesis anymore. Well, if that's the case, if you know of Adam and Eve, if that's just a fairy tale, well, then why would you have laws if there's no lawgiver? And, and why would marriage be one man and one woman for life if, if Adam and Eve is just a, a fairy tale, right? Why would you have that? If, if evolution is true, then marriage is just a cultural trend. And hey, the culture changes, so why shouldn't the definition of marriage change? And that's not just a hypothetical issue, is it? That's something we're seeing that's being attacked in our culture today. And you can see why that would inevitably happen. We need to recognize that our foundations are under attack. And the Bible says if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? See, a lot of uh, Christians get intimidated and they think, well, you know, a lot of smart people believe in evolution, so maybe, maybe I should too. Maybe God used it somehow. Uh, and, and therefore, Genesis... It really doesn't mean what it says. Maybe Genesis is just a parable or something like that. Well, Genesis isn't written like a parable. It's written like history. You know those verses you love to read before you go to bed? And so-and-so begets so-and-so, and they begets so-and-so. <laughs> like those genealogies like you read in Genesis 5. Well, those verses are there for a reason. They're there to tell us that Genesis really is history. It's the true history of the universe. It gives us the names of these people and the names of their children and sometimes how long they live. It's very specific and detailed. That's not a parable. You wouldn't have detailed information like that in a parable. That would be pointless. A parable is trying to uh, teach a spiritual truth by relating it to something physical that can we, we can relate to. Uh, a list of genealogies would be pointless in a parable. Parables usually don't have specific names anyway. It's usually there was a certain man or there was a king and, and what have you. And, I, and of course I recognize there are sections of the Bible that are not meant to be interpreted in a, in a wooden literal sense. We might think of the Psalms, for example. And, and of course it uses metaphors and things like that when it says there's no rock like our God. Uh, that doesn't mean God is igneous or basalt or something like that. We understand that, that's a metaphor, I get that. Poetic literature should be interpreted as poetic literature, I get that. It's still true, it just you, it requires the proper hermeneutic there. But is Genesis 5 poetic literature? That would be a terrible poem, wouldn't it? And so-and-so begets so-and-so. That's not poetry. It's even more obvious if you know something about the Hebrew language where they use parallelism as an indication of poetry, where you say something and you say the same thing using different words. Like the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Kind of says the same thing different ways. You get that. Genesis is not written that way. It's written as literal history. Frequent use of the Vav consecutive and so on. There's no doubt in Hebrew, if you know anything about the language, that this is meant to be interpreted as literal history. That's, the, that's what the author intended. And by the way, those genealogies that we find very boring and we want to skip, well, they lead up to Jesus. Yeah, you can, get the, you can read those in uh, Matthew and in uh, Luke. So here's my question then for Christians who compromise and say, I think evolution's true. I'm a Christian, I believe in Jesus, but I think Adam is just a metaphor. But Jesus is descended from Adam. You're saying Jesus is descended from a metaphor? That doesn't make any sense, does it? No, it's, it's theologically important that Jesus Christ is descended from a literal Adam, and so are we all. The Bible says in Acts 17, we're all of one blood. We're all descended from Adam. Eve was called the mother of the living, all living. And so we're all descended from them. That's theologically important. Why? Because it means Jesus is your relative. Yeah, he's, we're related to each other and to Christ. And you say, well, why is that important? Because according to biblical law, only a relative can save you. There's an important concept in biblical law called the kinsman redeemer. A kinsman, your relative, you're only eligible for salvation if you're related to Jesus. And so you see, if evolution were true, you might not really be related to Jesus. I mean, who knows, right? and you might not be eligible for salvation. 
It's, it's because Jesus is our relative that he can represent us on the cross. His blood counts for ours because we're all of one blood, you see. That's why we can be saved. That's why he can be our savior. And that's why animals cannot pay the penalty for sin. Now in the Old Testament, animal sacrifice was used as a symbol to, to, to show the Messiah to come, and they had to do it repeatedly because it doesn't actually take away sins, it was just symbolic, and the Bible makes that clear in Hebrews 10.4. But uh, nonetheless, only Christ can save us because he's, he's our relative. Animals can't save you because we're not related to animals, unless of course evolution's true. And then that doctrine's gone. You see how even the gospel message goes back to Genesis? Where do we learn that death is the penalty for sin? Genesis. Where do we learn that we need a savior to take our place? It's in Genesis. God promised that the descendant of Eve, the, the seed of Eve, would crush the head of the serpent. It's the gospel message right back to Genesis. Putting it another way, which Adam is non-essential to the gospel? Is it the first Adam that made it necessary for us to be saved, or is it Jesus Christ, whom the Bible calls the last Adam, who made it possible for us to be saved? We understand Christ is essential to the gospel. We get that. But my point is, the message of the cross doesn't make sense apart from a literal Adam and Eve. It really doesn't, because what are we being saved from? It's in Genesis we learn about sin. It's in Genesis we learn about the penalty for sin. It's in Genesis we learn we need a savior, that we are descended from Adam, born into a world, born sinners, descended from sinners, needing a way back to God. The Bible really is the history book of the universe. It tells us in the beginning God created, and it tells us the important events that have happened throughout history in terms of our relationship with God. And I find that uh, a lot of people actually like the morality the Bible teaches, they just want to reject the history. Oh, even atheists like some of the morality the Bible teaches. Thou shalt not murder, yeah, they like that one. <laughs> Thou shalt not kill, oh yeah, the Bible got that one right. But you see, the morality comes out of the history. Why is it wrong to murder? Because God historically made man in his own image. Male and female, he created them. That's why it's wrong to murder. Why is it wrong to steal? Because God apportioned to all men as he wills. He's made us stewards over aspects of his creation, you see. The, the, the moral teachings of the Bible come out of history. They can't be separated. Jesus put it like this. He was speaking to Nicodemus. He said, if I've told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? That's a pretty good question, isn't it? See, the Bible deals with both. Earthly things like matters of history, the days of creation, Noah's flood, and it deals with heavenly things like morality or salvation. And if you say, yes, but I'm not sure I believe in that, the literal history of Genesis. I think that's just a metaphor. I don't think those details are actually historically accurate. Hey, if God didn't get the details right in Genesis, how can you trust that he got the details right on how to inherit eternal life? You'd have to reject that too to be logically consistent. And of course, rejecting Christ as your savior, that is a salvation issue, isn't it? You see, we get intimidated and we think, well, you know, this, the smart scientists and they believe in evolution. There are, there are brilliant scientists who believe in evolution, but then again, there are brilliant uh, scientists who believe in creation. So that just cancels that right out, you see? But we get intimidated and we think, well, we gotta get these two together. We gotta maybe let God use evolution. If you're gonna get those two different versions of history to agree, guess which one it is that people tend to modify? Why is it they modify the infallible one to agree with what they want? And this is not the way that Jesus responded in his earthly ministry. Jesus stood on the authority of the written word, right? When the religious leaders came to him and they twisted theology, Jesus always responded, it is written, have you not read? Jesus took people back to the authority of the scriptures as his ultimate standard. There is a war going on today, folks, between the city of God and the city of man. Christianity versus secular humanism. That's the other great faith system in our culture today, and they're both faith systems. But you see, Christianity is based on creation. God's word is true from the beginning. Secular humanism is based on evolution. People have evolved, and therefore, we get to decide truth for ourselves. Now, how are we fighting this war? Perhaps not as effectively as we could be. We're arguing over issues that really aren't that significant. We're shooting billboards, which is okay. You get, it's fine to point out that abortion's wrong and racism's wrong. We need, to, we need to fight those issues, but my point is if that's all we're doing, those issues are just gonna keep coming back with brand new ones. They really are, because we're not dealing with the root of the problem. The root of the problem's down here. You see, those are just symptoms of an underlying philosophy that we can determine truth for ourselves. And that, that philosophy goes back to a rejection of Genesis as the history of the universe. The secular humanists are smart. They're aiming at our foundation, saying you can't trust Christianity because we know that God didn't even get the first chapters of the Bible right. 
We know millions of years of evolution is the way life came about. And many Christians think, well, yeah, we can, that's right. We can, we can reinterpret Genesis. And that's destroying the foundation of the Christian worldview because all those Christian doctrines directly or indirectly go back to Genesis. They really do. So what's the solution? Let's find his app billboards for, from time to time. We should do that. We should point out abortion's wrong. But we need to do more than that. We need to defend the faith against these speculations that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. We need to refute them and point out that evolution is a, is a bankrupt conjecture. It's not something that has good scientific support. It really doesn't. Most of the resources that we produce at ICR are along the lines of science, and they show how science confirms biblical creation. We want to show people that, that creation really does make sense. In fact, it's the only rational possibility. I've written about that in one of the uh, books that I'll tell you about a little bit later. We do this because not, because, not because it's an academic game, it's not. I'm not interested in debating for the sake of debating. So, you know, there are some people that like that, they just like to argue for the sake of argument. I'm not one of them. Uh, but I, I do need to argue because God tells me to. He tells me to make a defense when anyone asks a reason for the hope that's in me and to do so with gentleness and respect. And the reason I wanna do that is because I wanna, I wanna see people saved. That's why we exist at ICR, we wanna see we want to see people saved, and the way to do that, they have to believe in God's word. You, you, can't, you can't be saved apart from the believing in Christ as your savior, and Christ, of course, believed in Genesis. If people don't have confidence in the Bible, how are they gonna trust God's message of salvation? That's why we do what we do at ICR. We want those people to jump, jump off and swim over and join us on the city of uh, Christianity and be saved. What about the time scale of creation? That's something where there's a bit of controversy, although there really shouldn't be. The Bible tells us God created in six days. It tells us what he did on each of those days of creation. Human beings are made on the sixth day. And from those genealogies you love to read before you go to bed, and -and so-and-so begets so-and-so, you add up the ages, and you find it's something like 4,000 years between between, um, Adam and Christ's earthly ministry. And then 2,000 years since, something like 6,000 years for the age of the earth and the universe for that matter. And uh, boy, that bothers people, right? Because you know, you taught in all the secular schools that the world's billions of years old and the universe is even older. I went through the secular school system and I was taught that fossils are deposited over hundreds of millions of years. And you know, it's gotta be true because it says so right there in the textbook, see, millions of years. And I even confirmed it by going on the internet. And yeah, millions of years, there it is. <laughs> but we get intimidated, don't we? We get intimidated and we think, well, but yeah, I mean, the, most of the textbooks say that and a lot of the scientists believe in millions of years. So again, maybe, maybe God didn't use evolution, but maybe he created over millions of years. Well, where are you gonna fit that into the Bible? If you're a Christian and you say, yes, I'm a Christian, but I wanna believe in the millions of years, where are you gonna put it? You can't put it in between Adam and Christ because it would destroy those genealogies, right? You can't say, and so-and-so begets so-and-so, and then a million years later, they begets so-and-so. <laughs> That doesn't work, that doesn't make any sense. So the only place people can think to put it is in the creation week, somehow before Adam. And so how how are you gonna do that? Where are you gonna fit the millions of years into into the six days of creation? And some people have said, well, let's put them before the six days of creation, right? Let's put them before the beginning. And the problem with putting the millions of years before the beginning is that the beginning wouldn't be the beginning, right? right? Yeah, that's pretty easy to refute. Or maybe there's a gap in between verse one and verse two. We'll come back to that one, the so-called gap theory, or a few different versions of it, ruining reconstruction theory and so on. One of the most common days, the idea that the days weren't really days at all, but they were vast ages, hundreds of millions of years each, perhaps. And so that God really meant, he really meant to say that he created in one age, and then there's another age and he created over millions of years, and then he created over millions of years, and so on. It's, It's kind of a weird thought, though, because God says he made in six days. And there are Hebrew words he could have used if he wanted to indicate a long period of time, like olam, for example, which is a Hebrew word meaning a long period of time. So it's kind of like, you know, did God have a senior moment and forget what they meant and just accidentally swapped out the words? Or, you know, what's happening here? Of course, God doesn't do that. God's perfect, and he knows how to communicate to us. If we're honest, we, we must admit there's really no textual support for this idea. The days really are ordinary days. Uh, God uses the regular word for day there. But people sometimes will say, oh no, I think there is scriptural support for this because the Bible says in 2 Peter 3, 8, one day is with the Lord is a thousand years. See, there you go, those days could have been long periods of time. And I think it's funny because they only quote the first part of the verse. What does the rest of the verse say? One day is with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. It cancels that right out, you see. It goes the other direction. I find people only take the first part of the verse out of context to make time longer. They never take the second part out of context to make time shorter, right? 
Have you ever heard anybody say, well, the Bible indicates about 2,000 years between Abraham and Christ's ministry, but 1,000 years is a day, so it was really only two days. People don't do that. That would be ridiculous. And by the way, this isn't referring to the days of Genesis anyway. When you read it in context, it's referring to God's judgment and God delaying his judgment from a human perspective so that many people can be saved. It's describing God's patience and it's pointing out that of course God would be patient because he's beyond time. That's the only way a day can be like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day is if God is beyond time, which of course he is. He created time. Time has a beginning. That's kind of interesting. God's beyond it, you see. As mind-blowing as that is. This is not giving you permission to change the word day everywhere you see it into a thousand years. And by the way, that would make the earth 12,000 years old instead of 6,000. It doesn't get you anywhere close to the millions of years that people think they need to add to scripture. The Hebrew word for day is yom, and it's used over 2,000 times in the Old Testament of the Bible in singular and plural form. Plural form is yamim. And I find the only place people question what does day mean is in Genesis. Isn't that true? You don't hear people sitting around having Bible studies about other days in Scripture, like how long was Jonah really in the belly of the great fish? Were those ordinary days? Oh, no, I think those might have been thousands of years. He might have been in there a very long time, right? <laughs> no, people don't do that. Not at all. That would be ridiculous. We understand that's three days. Those are, those are days. We get that. People say, oh, but, but Dr. Lau, the Hebrew word for day can mean a period of time longer than 24 hours. And that's true in certain contexts, like when it's connected with a prepositional phrase, like in the day of the Lord. Okay, yeah, that would be, that, that would be a longer period of time. Not millions of years, perhaps, but at, at least uh, longer than 24 hours. But the main meaning overwhelmingly for day is day. That's overwhelmingly the meaning that, of the word yom. It really does mean day. Even our English word, in a poetic sense, can mean, our English word for day can mean something longer than 24 hours. You might say back in my father's day. Yeah, that's, that means back in my father's time. We understand that. It's not millions of years, but at least it's longer than 24 hours. Back in my father's day, it took three days to drive across Texas during the day. So you got the word day used three times, and I'll bet you didn't have any trouble understanding it because you used context. You used the surrounding words to understand the meaning, and that's true in English. It's true in any language. Three days, well, those would be ordinary days, wouldn't they? Because it wouldn't be three periods of time. That wouldn't make sense. To drive across Texas during the day, that would be the light portion of an ordinary day. It's really very clear. There's no doubt about that. It's the same way in Hebrew or in any language, and so let's take a look at the Hebrew word for day outside of Genesis 1, where we all agree what it means, and, uh, and take a look at it in context. And so, for example, when the word day is used in context with a number, like the first day, the second day, the third day, the fourth day is in an ordered list, it is always translated day every single time. Always very clearly means day in all the historical narrative uh, sections of the Bible. And that happens 410 times. We all agree it's an ordinary day. We understand that. If there was evening and morning, even if the word day isn't there, what's an evening plus a morning? It's a day, right? Yeah, and that happens 38 times outside Genesis 1. We all agree it's an ordinary day. If I said there was evening that day or there was morning that day, you'd understand I'm talking about an ordinary day. So either evening with day or morning with day means an ordinary day. It happens 23 times each outside of Genesis 1. We all agree it's an ordinary day. If I said there was day, then there was night. You'd understand I'm talking about an ordinary day, right? There's no doubt about that, and that happens over 50 times outside of Genesis 1. We all agree it's an ordinary day. These are, these are contextual clues that tell you that the day is to be interpreted in its normal, literal sense. And so let's go to Genesis 1 and see if we can figure out what God meant when he said day. Genesis 1, verse 5, and God called the light day. So there he's defining it for you. Day is when it's light out. That would be an ordinary day, wouldn't it? And the darkness he called night. You have night associated with day. That's got to be an ordinary day. And the evening, you got evening associated with day. That's got to be an ordinary day. And the morning, you got morning associated with day. That's got to be an ordinary day. You got evening and morning together. That constitutes an ordinary day. And you get a number with it. First day, it's got to be an ordinary day. Can there be any doubt that that first day is an ordinary day? God used about every contextual indicator he could possibly have used to make it clear. There's no doubt about that. Well, what about the other days of creation? Let's have a look here. Evening, morning, number, day. 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 That's pretty clear, isn't it? It's kind of like God saying, see, they're ordinary days, and in case you still don't get it, they're ordinary days, and in case you're a little thick, they're ordinary days, and in case you're really intellectually challenged, they're ordinary days. They really are. <laughs> 
That's pretty clear. Well, how can they be ordinary days, Dr. Lyle, when the sun wasn't made until day four? You don't need the sun to have, uh, to have day and night. You just need a light source and a rotating planet. Did we have a light source on the first day? And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Yeah, we had a light source on the first day. Did we have a rotating planet? Sure, there was evening and morning. We, it, the sun doesn't have much to do with the length of the day. It's primarily the rotation of the earth that causes it. Back in Martin Luther's time, there were some people who were saying that God actually created in one day. That's kind of the opposite problem we have today. They said God actually made everything in, one, in, in an instant. And I want to show you how Martin Luther responds to this. It's a good lesson for us. He says, how long did the work of creation take? When Moses writes that God created heaven and earth and whatever is in them in six days, then let this period continue to have been six days and do not venture to devise any comment according to which six days were one day. I love this last part, he says, but if you cannot understand how this could have been done in six days, then grant the Holy Spirit the honor of being more learned than you are. <laughs> I think that's a great quote. Well, then there's the gap theory. Well, you know, we got, we got to get the millions of years in there somewhere, but we can't, you know, the days are days. There's no getting around that. Maybe we can stick millions of years in between verse one and verse two. So in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and then millions of years later, the earth it was without form and so on and, and so forth. And, and uh, maybe, maybe in that millions of years was the fall of Lucifer and some people try to put the dinosaurs in there and so on. But you really can't do that uh, grammatically because of the way the Hebrew is constructed there. Hebrew, this is uh, Genesis 1 in Hebrew. Hebrew reads right to left. And so verse two uses a construction called a vav disjunctive. That's when you start with and, the Hebrew word and letter for and, uh, followed by a non-verb, like a noun, like and the earth. Okay, that would be an example of a vav disjunctive. Whenever you have that in Hebrew, it's, it's, it's telling you that that is a comment on what came before it, a clarification or a comment on what came before it. And my point is, therefore, you cannot put time between verse one and verse two, because verse two doesn't follow in time. It's not like verse two, and then later, the earth you know, became without form or void. No, no, it's describing the conditions of the earth when it was first created, and the Hebrew grammar really requires it to be that way. Now, the rest of Genesis is different. The rest of Genesis is vav consecutive, and that's where you have and followed by a verb, and said God in the original Hebrew word order, and that does follow in time. But those are just, we've already seen those are ordinary days. So it's interesting, the one place people try to shove the millions of years is one place where Genesis isn't speaking chronologically. Verse two is what we use parentheses for in English. It's clarifying what the earth was like in verse one. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, parentheses, and the earth was without form and void, et cetera, at that time, meaning. What about the science? There's a lot of science that confirms that God created recently and not millions of years ago. The fact that we find C14 in diamonds, for example. Uh, C14 is an unstable variety of carbon, most carbon C12, but a small fraction of it is C14, and C14 will spontaneously change into nitrogen with a half-life of 5,700 years. 5,700 years. It can't last even one million years. All the, all the C14 will be gone if these things were really even one million years old, and yet secularists believe them to be billions of years old, two billion years old for these diamonds. So. Uh, again, there's a lot of stuff like that, and uh, dinosaur soft tissue, and we've even found dinosaur red blood cells. Isn't that interesting? Now, that's, that's not something that can last 65 million years. Not blood, not at all. Well, does it really matter? That's my next question, because historically, the scientists came along and said the Bible's not true, because we know these rock layers are millions of years old. And a lot of the theologians compromised and said, well, maybe we can allow for the millions of years. And that's where, that's why the gap theory was invented, by the way, it was to try and accommodate the millions of years. And likewise, the day age uh, theory was, try, was to try and accommodate that. And I think they were well-meaning, there's, there's no doubt about that. But nonetheless, this is, this is an important issue and it is something that we ought to really think about and be ready to defend. And uh, it's important for a couple of reasons, but I'm just gonna share one with you today for time's sake. And that has to do with these fossils that we find all over the earth. And we do find fossils all over the earth. We find fossils of marine organisms, marine organisms, ocean dwelling creatures buried on land. That's kind of interesting, even on the highest mountaintops. Yes, Mount Everest has marine fossils on the top of it. Interesting, it's almost as if there was a worldwide flood. Uh, actually, there was a worldwide flood, how about that? But you see, secularists, they, the, the worldwide flood would account for these fossils easily. And you can do that, you can do them all in the flood year. It's not a problem. With maybe a few afterwards, but most of them during the flood year. But secularists say, no, there was no worldwide flood. These fossils were deposited gradually over hundreds of millions of years. Now, if you believe that fossils are hundreds of millions of years old, you've got a huge theological problem as a Christian. Because you see, a fossil is a dead thing. 
right? That's what they are, they're dead things. And if you've got death 100 million years ago, that means you've got death before Adam sinned. In fact, you've got death before Adam even existed because we all agree human beings don't go back hundreds of millions of years. Human beings are recent. But doesn't the Bible teach that death came into the world as a result of Adam's sin? Isn't that indeed the penalty for sin? Even if you reject evolution, well, I don't believe in evolution, but I think maybe God created over hundreds of millions of years of death and suffering. Well, that means by death came man, but the Bible teaches by man came death. Those are logically contrary positions. They cannot both be true. They can't. When God saw everything he'd made, behold, it was very good, the Bible says. It wasn't just the Garden of Eden. God saw everything he'd made, and behold, it was very good. But if God had been creating over billions of years of death and suffering, disease, bloodshed, carnivorous activity, and so on, and finally gets around to creating Adam and Eve and says, behold, it's very good, that means you got the Garden of Eden sitting on top of billions of years worth of death and suffering, disease, bloodshed, and so on. You know, we find fossils with evidence of disease in them, things like cancer, arthritis, and so on. Is that part of God's very good earth? See, if you believe the fossils are millions of years old, you have to believe that, because it wasn't until the sixth day that God saw everything he'd made, and behold, it was still very good at that point, right? Which means, which means by the way, even Satan hadn't fallen at the, at, by the sixth day, right? Because he even, yeah, everything God made was very good. That would include angels. Hmm. But you see, if you believe in millions of years, and death and suffering are part of the world, well, first of all, death can't be the penalty for sin, then that's out. And that also means that disease and bloodshed are very good. And so when your friend gets cancer, why bother praying for them? That's good that they got cancer. Do you see how devastating that way of thinking is if you follow it through to its logically consistent end? It just doesn't make sense, not at all. Now some people would say, well, just human death that entered when, uh, when Adam sinned. I don't think you can defend that scripturally because when, when Adam sinned and God confronted Adam and Eve, right, he then provided Skins of clothing, where did those come from? God killed an animal or animals to provide, those are animal skins that he provided for Adam and Eve. God instituted animal death at the time of Adam's sin. Yeah, so it's not just human death that was introduced. Now some people say, well, you have to have death of plants, but I got news for you, plants biblically are not classified as alive. Did you know that? The Bible has a special word, nephesh, nephesh kai, living creatures, and it applies to human beings, and it applies to animals. It's not used of plants. And so they're not technically alive to begin with, and so technically they can't die, if you see what I'm saying. We sort of understand that, right? I mean, biologists might classify plants as living, but we understand they're in a different category, right? You can talk about a dead tree. That doesn't mean it was ever really alive in in the sense that animals are. You can talk about a dead battery, but that doesn't mean the battery was ever really alive, and we understand that. We understand that difference. You come across a so-called dead tree. Well, that's nice. I think I'll sit on that for a little while, take a picture of it, put it over my mantle. If you come across a dead animal, you say, well, that's nice. I think I'll, you know, sit on that for a little while, take a picture of it. it." (laughs) That's different, isn't it? Yeah, because you see, dead, the plant cycles would have been fine before sin. That's that's no problem. But animals would not have died in a world that was very good. Uh, And indeed, human beings would not have died in a world that's very good. But because of sin, we now live in a world that's not very good. Oh, there's a lot of beauty in today's world, don't get me wrong, but there's a lot of ugliness too because of sin. But you see, Christ has promised that we can be part of the new heavens and the new earth if we trust in him, and and paradise lost will be paradise restored. And so you can actually use this information, you see, to tie it into the gospel message, which I think is a very effective and uh, useful way of, of, of using this information. Well, I got a lot more material, but we'd be here for millions of years if I continued. So. Let me, just, uh, let me just sum it up with this. It's because of Genesis is true that we know that, that, uh, that we need a savior. It's in Genesis we learn that Adam sinned and we're born into a world needing a, needing a way back to God and that way is Jesus Christ, the last Adam who took Adam's place, who took our place on the cross to die for our sins. It's a truly awesome message and it's, it's a true message, it's one we can trust. But we all need to be able to defend that, right? Because when people come along and they say, well, what about this science that allegedly you know, proves millions of years or, you know, or, or proves evolution. We need to be ready to, to give an answer for that. Now, that doesn't mean you have to go out and get a PhD in science. God calls a few people to, to do that, like myself. But uh, what we do is we write books to help the rest of you do that. And uh, we, all, we all need to be equipped to defend the Christian faith. I want to show you some of the resources that we have in the back uh, just to... Um, 
I hope you'll get some of these and really, really make use of them. Understanding Genesis, are the days really days of creation? Well, yes, they are, and this is gonna show you how to defend that, and it also goes through, and I, and I show how to refute uh, folks who think that, well, maybe the days are millions of years, or maybe theistic evolution is true, and I show scripturally how that, uh, how that won't work. Creation basics and beyond, it goes through and, and talks about a lot of the science. What about, um, you know, what about uh, the Noah's flood? Where did the water come from? Where did it go, and how did Noah get all the animals on the ark, and were there dinosaurs on the ark, and where do they fit into biblical history, and was there an ice age? All answered in that book. Yeah, and if you say, my, that looks thick and intimidating, we have a student version as well, okay? You can get that one, and that one's thinner, and it's got pictures, so there you go. Uh, this is one I, I hope that, uh, I hope, I would really like to see every one of you get this book. This is called The Ultimate Proof of Creation. It's gonna show you that creation has to be true in order for things like science to even be possible. It's a very powerful argument, and it's gonna also train you how to use this information in sort of a, like a debate or you know, a conversation that you're having with your friend. Again, we're not out to win debates. We wanna win people, but sometimes you gotta win the debate to win the person, really. You have to uh, get, get rid of all the, the muck, the incorrect thinking in order to, to show people that God's word is true from the beginning. I wish every college student would read this, preferably before they go to college. I think we'd have a lot fewer stories of them walking away from the Christian faith if they knew how to think properly, and that's what that book is training you how to do. Discerning truth, how to spot logical fallacies and arguments that evolutionists uh, often use. That's a useful tool as well. You say, I don't have time to read, no problem, we got DVDs as well. We actually have this presentation that I did for you today, we have that on DVD, it's actually a longer version of it, so if you're wondering what all those slides I skipped were, and were those as funny as some of the other ones? Yeah, they are, they're good. So you need to get the longer version of it as well. I've also got one called The Secret Code of Creation, and that's gonna show you where God has built beauty and incredible complexity into a place you probably never even thought about. And there's no secular explanation for it at all. There's, there's just no answer for it. Secret code of creation, very uh, interesting and powerful resource. My expertise is actually astronomy. I've written a number of resources on that, like the Stargazer's Guide on the Night Sky, to just how to better enjoy the night sky. And taking back astronomy, how to, uh, to, to show how that the universe really does declare God's glory, and not a big bang or billions of years. We also have some free resources for you, including Acts and Facts magazine. How many of you are already getting Acts and Facts magazine? Okay, are there none righteous? Oh, okay, we got, we got one or two, all right. Okay, this is a free monthly family magazine, and I would encourage you to get it. Those of you that have not signed up, which is most of you, you need to repent of that sin and sign up on the sheet back there. And uh, it really is free, there's no catch, we just wanna bless you. Uh, not too many things free in this world, just uh, salvation and Acts and Facts, so there you go. And please check us out on the web, ICR. If we, run, if we run out of anything, of course, you can get them on the website. And we might, we might run out of stuff, but that's what you get for coming to third service. So there you go. Thank you very much for having me out to speak. I really appreciate it.